973. This is LBC. Bom dia, four minutes after eight, Tuesday the 17th of September. Yes, it is called the Commissioner. Commissioner of Metropolitan Police, most senior police officer in the country. I speak of Cressida Dick, but before we go any further, I have to say it is, of course, I understand Dame Cressida Dick. I'm, not, I'm still going to address you as Commissioner. Has it actually happened and how do you feel about it? And, of course, congratulations. I've known you for some years. Well, thank you. Um, it's amazing news. It hasn't sunk in. Uh, no, it hasn't actually happened. Uh, I'm really pleased for you know the people I've worked with over the years and my, and my family, uh, but it, but it hasn't sunk and what's in. The reaction? It's a great honour. What's the reaction been around the factory around Scotland Yard? What have your colleagues been saying to you? Um, quite a lot of smiles. Uh, I think quite a lot of quite a lot of you know old mates are very pleased, um, uh, and of course it being the police, you get quite a lot of uh, banter and I uh, bet you do teasing. Yeah, tell so me just good. one of the teasing that you've endured. <laughs> uh, well, um, I've I've not enjoyed any uh, the thoughts um, they keep asking me, you know, uh, which is actually not the case. Uh, will your partner be Lady Helen? She doesn't enjoy that either too much. <laughs> um, and uh, what else? I haven't. Um, uh, there have been some good names, you know, yes. uh, Dame Cress of the Yard and all that sort of thing, muddling up the, the thing. Anyway. I want everyone to call me Cress. All right. I've always wanted that. So we don't change call the commissioner to dial Dame Dick. We don't. You, we wouldn't go to something as crass as that, Commissioner. No, it sounds rather pantomime to it does, me. Doesn't it? Nick, Should we move I've got on? A serious job. So we move, we have serious job, and indeed your job impacted now by the Prime Minister because it would appear that Boris Johnson is determined to make police numbers a key issue for his government and possibly even possibly even for an upcoming general election. We talk of twenty thousand officers probably being made available. Um, Commissioner, how many of those officers do you want for the Met? Well, I hope we'll find out in the next two or three weeks. Uh, it's clearly very welcome news. I've uh, suggested uh, that um, a sort of a proportionate amount for London, given the challenges we face uh, with um, you know, violence, the scale of the city, the changing demographics, the demands that have gone up, the protests that we're dealing with, I've said about 6,000. OK. OK. And we're taking a call on Tony and Harlow in just a moment. Just before we bring Tony into the conversation... How will you and your colleagues make sure, because you don't want the first 6,000 men and women who come through the door, you want selection to be right, you want the right blokes and women doing the job. Absolutely. How will you gauge, yeah. how will you run that? Because mm. there's a danger, you might say, great, in you come. No, Do you recognise that? We ab absolutely, we mustn't reduce our standards. Uh, we're fortunate in the Met, because in the last couple of years, as you know, we've uh, been growing, not hugely, but we have been. So we've got a very strong recruiting machine. I'm at a passing out parade on Thursday. I'll see over 200 new officers. The following month, I think it's 300. The month after that is 400. So we've already got our systems, our processes set up. Uh, we are not short of applicants. Uh, we're really not. And good quality applicants as well. So we put the people through a fairly testing uh, series of, of hoops before they even arrive at the assessment centre to make sure they are sure that they're the right sort of people for us. Uh, and then there's an, a two-day assessment centre. Um, oh. And then obviously they have to pass some vetting and some medical and that kind of thing. So we're not going to lower the standards, but I'm really confident that we can um, take in even more. We, we, we've got lots and lots of applications. Well, let's talk numbers now. Tony and Harlow, you're through to the Commissioner. Go ahead, Tony. Good morning, sir. Oh, good morning. Um, I've got a 23-year-old grandson who, who's in the Met. He's, um, he's, been in the, he's been in the police since he was 14. He was a cadet. And all he wanted to do was be a police officer. He, he was the last one, one of the last ones to pass out of Hendon. Great. And say? Yeah, that's great news. <laughs> the commissioners are applauding that. What's your question regarding your grandson, oh, Tony? Uh, uh, well, when I ask him about the police, you know, he says we need more police. He, he said we can't do our job unless we've got more police. He yes. Said. And they've all got to be trained up, he said. So how long is it going to take? And he's... I see. He's really concerned about it. But I, I can understand that. That's a good point. So we've talked a little bit about numbers broadly for, for Tony's grandson and all the men and women who serve under you, Commissioner. How long is the training period? When do you think they'll actually be... It's all very good to get them. When will they be online, effectively? Mm -hmm. Well, a f a f what we would think of as a sort of fully trained, fully competent, really OK to go out completely by themselves and deal with most things takes about two years. But, of course, they're out on the streets doing meaningful things very, very soon after they arrive in training. Uh, just a matter of a, f a few weeks, actually, but they're with a, with another officer. So they're, they're showing a presence, they're learning the job, they're doing some things that, you know, your average member of the public would probably find quite demanding. Um, but you're quite right, it takes a while to get people trained up. But the good news, I think, Tony, is, as I've said, we are already growing. 
So at our lowest point, I'm sorry to say, about 18 months ago, we were only just over 29,000, something like that. By the by, December, we will be 31,000 uh, and uh, continuing to grow. Whatever the announcement from the government, we're, com- we're obviously going to get another many, many, several thousand. And I hope, as I say, 6,000. Uh, and we will try to get those in in two to three years. That would um, take you so, to the highest compliment ever, wouldn't it? If you got to 37,000, um, I don't think you've ever been that high. No, I, I agree with you nick i think in the i think i'm right in saying you and i are both um older so to speak we go back to the noughties and at that at uh, in the in the mid noughties i think we went to about over thirty four thousand. but you must remember that was before some of the real change threats like terrorism yeah well also the city is growing the city is growing hugely um you know probably it'd be nine and a half million soon and you compare that with the 2011 census you know it's growing very very fast getting younger uh, and also getting older. So all these things bring different challenges and demands. And of course, the digital age has as well. So don't don't think for one second that if I if we have 36, 37,000 officers, we won't be right. still doing very productive work and very busy. Nobody be twiddling their thumbs, I can assure you. Tony, good luck to your grandson. Before I come to the next caller, Mick, um, Boris Johnson posed in front of officers in Wakefield a couple of weeks ago, copped a bit of criticism. Would you have allowed Met officers to take part in that photo? Um, I still, I was actually away when this happened. I still don't know exactly what happened. I do think, um, frankly, it was a rather unfortunate image for all concerned. Um, And uh, as an aside, we uh, we had the Chancellor at Hendon on the same day because he wanted to meet officers. He wanted to talk to us about the the announcement and the numbers that were being, um, uh, might come our way and find out what we would do with them. Uh, and you know he, he he is the prime minister. He is the chancellor. They are making announcements about uh, about increased police numbers. Uh, it seems entirely proper for me f- to me f- that we should be talking to them. We should be meeting them. That we should be trying to influence uh, you know scale and disposition. However, to make uh, a highly political speech in front of a group of police officers um, does seem to me to be uh, rather problematic on all sides. And how it happened, I don't know. Um, but I'm sure everybody wishes it hadn't. I'm glad to say nothing like that happened at Hendon. Mick's in Romford. Mick, your question to the Commissioner. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, I heard yesterday that you're interviewing fire service personnel under caution in reference to their actions at Grenfell. I'd like to know what's behind that. And also, are you also interviewing the subtractor, the tra- the contractors and the people that supplied the, the cladding under caution? This is Grenfell Tower disaster investigators interviewing LFB, London Fire Brigade leaders, over possible health and safety offences that may have contributed to the deaths of 72 people. Commissioner, without prejudicing anything, how far can you go? So I always try to be as open as I possibly can be, but Nick, you will know that we do not comment on who we are interviewing in uh, the Grenfell Tower investigation. Let's look at this a different way. If you interview someone under caution, what does that mean? Just generally, any inquiry now. You come round to my house and you think that I've broken into next door. Interviewing under caution means what? So interviewing under caution means that there are grounds to believe uh, that you may possibly have committed a criminal offence and, in essence, you the organisation or you the individual, uh, and, in essence, in order for you to be properly protected... We must caution you and you have certain rights, for example, to have a solicitor present and all that kind of thing. So we can't just roll up and talk to you as a witness when we know full well that something you say could contribute further to evidence that might, only might, amount to a criminal offence. We have interviewed, uh, to go to the question, 17 people under caution. That's a very wide range of Uh, individuals and organisations and we will continue to do our job impartially fairly and properly Uh, and you know obviously if if people uh, or you know people can be brought to justice that would of course uh, bring huge satisfaction to people who lost their lives uh, families and other other victims but we will do our job very carefully and very judiciously and uh, we will do it proportionately and this and extend only what to third is necessary parties, contractors this could extend to third uh, parties absolutely well. of course certainly and, and does the commission of the lfb will she be interviewed under caution i've i've told you i'm not going to talk about individuals or organizations who have been or may be john's in cambridge john your call good morning to you sir Good morning. Um, my uh, parents recently uh, moved back uh, to the border of Ireland um, in about two years ago now. And obviously since uh, the Brexit scenario has 
crept up coming up to October 31st, what precautions are being t- uh, being taken in? Uh, because there are very aware signs of dissident uh, groups uh, in the north. And I was wondering what measures are being taken to make sure that nothing erupts. Um, because it is, the threat is, right. I believe, very uh, serious. So this question is clearly primarily for the Chief Constable of the Police yes. Service of Northern Ireland, and I, and I don't have jurisdiction over there, but simply to say, uh, I think on this side of the water, we look with, with um, shock and uh, disgust at some of the things that have happened in the last six months. There clearly are uh, both tensions, attacks on police officers, and of course there's, there's been uh, murders and attempted murders. Horrible events there. And I know people are concerned about uh, what uh, may or may not happen after EU exit. Of course, there's lots of uncertainties there. What I can say is that my counter-terrorist people work really closely with um, the police service of Northern Ireland. Uh, and of course, so do um, MI5, who support them hugely in countering terrorism in uh in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, we also work very closely with our Garda colleagues. Um, and if the Chief Constable of Northern Ireland were to ask for assistance from us in any further way, uh, then we are committed to, to helping. We haven't been asked to do that beyond our normal, if I can call it, counter-terrorist work. But if we if we were asked, we would. If I say Operation Yellowhammer to you, you'll obviously be aware these are the papers yeah. for pre- pre- preparedness in the event of a no-deal Brexit. How does that affect the Met? What, what work has been done there? We've been uh, preparing for um, well over a year uh, for various different scenarios. Uh, we've had different planning assumptions about what might happen in terms of uh, changing uh, laws and, uh, for example, you know, the European arrest warrant, access to European systems, what we would do if we don't have that, what we will do if we have increased protest on the streets. And you'll have seen over the last six to nine months quite a lot of extra protest in central London in relation to the EU exit Brexit issues. Uh, and then finally, at the point of exit, uh, together with our what's called resilience partners, the local authorities, the London Fire Brigade and others, uh, we've been looking at a variety of scenarios. So I, I, I think it's very hard to predict exactly what will happen. Um, but what you can be assured of, Nick, is that we've been exercising, we've been training, we've been thinking about different scenarios. But what of this report from the Thames Valley published over the summer, which you might or might not have had sight of, which suggests that gangs could employ, exploit, I'm sorry, exploit demand for scarce drugs from worried patients and parents and everyone else, and there could be a hidden market there. You're aware of this? I haven't actually seen, seen this is a Tem- that. This is a Thames right. Valley Police report talking about a worst-case scenario possibly gangs would turn to supplying medical supplies that were frozen in Europe. Uh, well, I can see that is one one possibility. I think it's all. it's only that, though. It's one possibility. Uh, and uh, there's a whole series of things we don't how know about. How concerned are you by a no-deal Brexit? Policing, um, not, not politically, policing. Well, I, what I think about a no-deal Brexit, and indeed, the, you know, the period we are, we're in at the moment is that this is this is something for our politicians to sort out. Police people need to be impartial. We need to not get involved. The public want to see us getting on with our jobs, which we are. They want us being resilient, which we are, showing integrity, supporting them, and being prepared for different scenarios. Um, I do not uh, sit here, you know, worrying away about what's going to happen when we come out of out of the EU. We need to plan for different scenarios. We need to be prepared for different scenarios. And you're confident uh, and you are. And we are. And Absolutely. you are confident that you yeah. are. All right. Uh, Matt in Dartford, you're through to the Commissioner. Go ahead, Matt. Morning to you. Hi, I'm Morning. Um, my question is, uh, with the um, increased level of taser officers being promised by several constabularies, including the Met, are you going to make tasers readily available for every trained officer? Now, this supports a campaign you might mm. or might not have heard. Yeah. I'm sure your colleagues have made you aware this was the, the Nick Ferrari campaign, Time for Tasers. You'll be aware that uh, your counterparts in counties such as Northamptonshire and in Kent are moving towards that. It is thought Thames Valley will move towards that. Is it one man or woman, one taser in the Met? Not at the moment, no. Um, but what I can say is that it's the one thing that I asked for before I became commissioner was an uplift in taser. We up, have uplifted, we've uplifted again, and we're currently uplifting again. So uh, when, I, numbers, yeah, when I arrived in the Met, we had um, just about 4,400. Uh, we've now got um, just under 6,500, so that's a 50% increase, I suppose, yep. uh, nearly. Uh, yeah, it is. It's a 50% yes, it increase. Uh we are taking part in the National Police Chiefs Council review of all aspects of officer safety and indeed my own board is meeting in two weeks' time, so I anticipate that we will be announcing a further uplift after that. But London is um, 
I think, quite different. Uh, I don't want to comment on what my colleagues have done and why. Uh, suffice to say, what I've sought to do was to get much greater availability, both through numbers and training, better bit of kit, uh, also policies so that we could be single crewed, for example, so that people who are already trained but in a different job could still use their taser. There are a variety of ways of getting more and more taser onto the ground. We now have a lot more taser than we had a couple of years ago. I think we will probably uplift, but it's not with with greatest respect, it's not all about taser. We are putting new batons on the street that the officers prefer, work better. We're putting parva spray out. As you know, we're putting spit guards Why do they prefer? Out. Uh, the, the, the new baton. batons that yeah. are coming, they're, they're longer. They give a slightly f- easier... Um, they're they're easier to use. Yeah. You've got to get so closer, I'm, I'm, though. It, um, you've, no, you haven't. You No, our new ones, they give you a greater standoff. Right. And also... Mind you, if a uh, guy's got a sword... Well, it's still better with a taser, uh, aren't you, Commissioner? Uh, it depends on the circumstances, quite clearly. Um, but taser is a great bit of kit. I won't okay. have anybody say anything other than that. But it's been a great bit of kit, and it, man, has, one saved, officer, one it has saved lives. I don't think that right now that is either practicable in the short and medium term or necessary. I'm talking to my people. I'm listening to them all the time. As you know, and I think Ken Marsh, our Federation guy, said on your programme not long ago, about 20% of my people have said in a survey they don't really want to carry taser. Thank you very much. It is a very uh, powerful bit of kit. It's also potentially a very dangerous bit of kit. You've got to be a really good decision maker. You've got to be really fit. Let's just get a quick response. Matt. Yeah, just really quickly, just when you have that meeting about with the other forces, the only concern that we have is that what will happen is that it will be a tick box exercise where people will be trained in taser, but like in my division, there's only probably a handful of tasers tasers available when there's about five or six people in each team that are not able to carry taser when they're trained, so that was our concern, that you can have the training, but there's not the operational equipment needed to to meet the resource need. Thank you, Matt. Are Are you in the Met? No, I'm not. No. All right. Okay. Well, Kent, I, I've actually, I as, as an aside, I've heard this um, uh, just in the Met yesterday. And what we're doing at the moment is dip sampling, uh, you know, on an a- average hour in the morning, evening and in the middle of the night. How many are there really out on the streets with the re- emergency response teams, with road traffics and, and, and everybody else who's patrolling around London? I want to be assured that what you're suggesting could happen hasn't been happening and won't happen. Lastly, before we move on, would you ever? I respect that people will have signed up to do the job. They don't want to carry weapons. I get that. Yeah. Would you ever move to a position that intake would have to be told you will be required to carry a taser? Um, again, I know this is something some people think is a, a is a good idea. Uh, they, what they assume is that in the very long run, you know, everybody will have a taser at some point. So why not start now? It's something I want to talk with my my board about. Okay. Do are we comfortable with probationers carrying taser at the moment? They don't. Are we comfortable with, for example, neighbourhood officers, uh, schools officers? Even I don't think the public would be very comfortable with that. Uh, well, but so we'll see. All right. We'll see. Okay. Thank you. We move on to other matters. Mohammed in Watford. Mohammed, you're on the radio. Your question. Go ahead, sir. Hi, I, I, I've got a very simple question. If I was to be caught selling uh, illegal weapons online, I would be arrested. Uh, why is Instagram or Facebook or other social media uh, companies exempted from this? Mm. So you're right, there is a specific offence uh, of selling knives to somebody under 18, for example, and selling online. Uh, is included in that but it's the person that actually makes the sale as opposed to the platform yes and we've been working and as have the government closely with a lot of the social media companies on all the things that are done in the great world of the internet and in social media which is so positive in so many ways but that can be harmful whether you're talking about terrorism gangs knives whatever just to clarify some of these sites of course advertise they don't actually sell but you may be aware of a, a troubling new trend and i'm going to pass a couple of items to you and i urge you to take care these are specifically marketed for young women because it looks like a, a pretty comb and a lipstick. Mm. Commissioner, if you open them, you'll see... What, now, these were bought from the United States. Uh, go carefully as you open them. Yep. And you, I think you know what's going to be inside. If you pull the top of the comb off, you'll see that that's that. And that cost about £11. And that's available just by going on the net. And then again, if you were to open that lipstick as if you were to wish to apply it, you will see... Please, please go carefully because they're very sharp. You'll see what's inside there if you give it a tug. And then you rotate it. If you horrible. Read, yeah, you can see there's horrible, a claw horrible. knife inside. What needs to be done as regards these, Commissioner? First thing to say is this sort of phenomenon is not completely new. If, if I took you to our collection at the yard, 
I could show you things from the 19th century, the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s that are very similar. In fact, we've got a comb that is, is that exactly right? that. So this is not a new idea. Um, and our officers, for example, are constantly trained not to assume that a comb like that is a comb and be very careful because it might not be. A concealed stiletto, as they used to be called, is not uncommon. However... Um, such uh, things arriving by post or arriving as a result of an online sale is obviously new uh, and of of real concern. I go back to you know there is a responsibility on the companies. I'm sure you will have spoken to We've talked whoever about this it was before as well in the past. Um, we? Yes, and there is there is a responsibility. I'm not suggesting it's easy for them to stop all of these kinds of things, uh, but I do think we should have a concerted effort, and that's what sits behind the current government's online harms white paper. We ought to all work to stop this. Equally, you know, we'd be interested to know who who this actually came from because it's useful for our intelligence, yeah. even if we can't actually bring anybody else to justice. We move. Thank you for that, Commissioner. We move to other matters. Aaron is in High Wycombe. Aaron, you're on the radio. Good morning. Good morning, Cressida. Um, so my question is, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Londoner, I love London, and I have a, 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 a 12-year-old son. Uh, he is black, so from a BA, BAME background. And it's great news that the government finally woken up to give you the required amount of police for this great city. So my question is, is with regards to all these new newbies coming onto the Met, how are we going to make sure and ensure that when they do what they have to do, which is stop and search, so I want my son to be safe, okay, they do it in a way that is going to not alienate boys like my son sure. um, from the Metropolitan Police. Sure. Commission. Thank you. Great question. I think the first thing to say is that I hope that your son will meet police people in a non-adversarial context uh, and see them in that way before anybody goes around, um, you know, approaching him, if ever, to stop and search him. Um, so that's why we've got officers in schools. That's why we'll be improving our presence on the streets. Uh, that's why the Met is first and last a, a local police service. And, it, and it, as it grows, that's what will continue. And, and, it will, it, and we will want to be meeting your son as the friendly face of the Met. Um, when it comes to stop and search, which, as you say, we do need to use, we have been using a lot, uh, increased amounts over the last couple of years, it's vital that the officers are properly uh, properly trained. They all now have body-worn video, so we can and do dip sample all the time. I think they are extremely professional. I think the stop and search of today is so different from even 10 years ago, let alone 20 or 30 years ago. Um, but we have to train them obviously not just in how to sort of comply with the law but how to work with and talk to people from all communities and particularly young people uh, and that's an ongoing thing so we, we do a lot in training school I think we can probably get even better uh, for example one of the areas that I uh, think we could we could probably get even better at is is uh, working with young people who have kind of low comprehension skills themselves so so they find it hard to understand us uh, or any adult, and, and our guys need to understand how to talk best with them. Um, but professional, intelligence-led, polite, explanation, proper record, and an explanation that if you, you know, you can complain if you if you're not happy, of course, and we'll always investigate it, and we can look at the body-worn video. Aaron, thank you for that. Eight twenty-seven, Commissioner, you will be aware questions are being asked in some areas as to your involvement in Operation Midland. This was the the, the Nick inquiry, if you were. What was your knowledge of that operation? Mm. Um. So I was Assistant Commissioner Specialist Crime and Operations, um, appointed in July, I think, 2014. Um, Operation I, Midland started in November. Exactly. 2014. And I left the Met uh, at the end of 2014 and, in fact, was, was handing over um, during December 2014. So I would uh, say my involvement was short and at the very beginning. I was a senior assistant commissioner, you know, I was the assistant commissioner for that bit of the business that dealt with child abuse, dealt with homicide, dealt with rape. Uh, and uh, so I was given some briefings about the start of Operation Midland. How concerned were you when you heard that the suggestions were credible and true from one of the detectives working under you, the witness, uh, the statements given by Nick? So I think everybody uh, thinks that that was um, just a mistake. It shouldn't have been said. I'm sure the officer himself who said that uh, regrets it. 
I can actually remember where I was uh, when when I heard that, and I was very surprised, and I just felt for him immediately because I where were you? I, I was driving my car oh, somewhere right, else, right? Uh, and I remember thinking, oh no, I know he didn't mean to say that. What he will have meant to say was, this person appears credible, and unfortunately, when press, press, pressed, he said credible and true, and uh, 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 you know that has, of course. You know, it was was a mistake. It was unfortunate, and it dented people's confidence in the investigation from there on in. So, did you authorise the setting up of Operation Midland? Um, I, I I was the the line manager for uh, the DAC. Is that DAC who Rod set House, it Steve up. House. I was yeah. the line manager for the DAC who set up Operation Midland. You, I, I do want to take you back to that time. Mm. We had the child sex abuse public inquiry just been set up. We had a huge number of of child abuse investigations going on. Historic some of which brought people successfully to justice, as you will remember. We were just at the well, end. None of, the, of them involving Carl Beach, a.k.a. Uh, Nick. Certainly not. No. We were, because he was a total liar, we now know. We were... Wouldn't have um, taken much dealing, to work that out, would well, it, Commissioner? I, I'm, I'm not going to get drawn into lots and lots Even of comments on this. We are, we are going to publish, uh, as you know, the Henriquez Review, which our previous Commissioner brought in to look at what happened there, what was done well, what was not done so well, and what we can learn what from. What was done well The in IOPC Midland. are going to also publish their report, I think, at the end of this month. They will have some lessons learned for us. My job but as Commissioner is not to comment and and uh you know go on about what happened in the past i wasn't there i was i was not in policing for the vast majority of the time that midland took place my job is to make sure that the met does has learned the lessons does learn the lessons and we look forward but But i do want to pay tribute to some of the officers around at that time who did some fantastic work on child sexual abuse i'm not talking about that particular investigation which was really really horrible in the impact it had on the people who were investigated and so high profile in the media. Uh, I'm sh- but, I can't put myself in their shoes. must have been appalling. But lastly on this, y- you agree then it was a shambles? It, I didn't it wasn't actually say that. But no, okay, well, look, sorry, you, you agree then it was horrific, I think was I think your it was, word. It was horrific in its impact on the individuals, absolutely. It was possibly a stain on the Met's reputation. I think it has damaged the Met's reputation, yes. Yet no senior officer has been in any way sanctioned, in any way. We've, Indeed, some have been promoted. So we've had an independent inquiry by the IPCC, now the Independent Office of Police Conduct. They have said the officers act in good faith, there was no malice, that, and they did their best. They have also said, well actually they, I don't think they said did their best, but that's the inference. Um, they've also said that in their view, as an independent, and they're not shy at coming forward to criticise uh, an independent body, they do not think this amounts to uh, misconduct or um, criminal action. But I have to respect their view. Right. And I think we do. There's a due process, and it's happened. Yes. I mean, the Henriquez report, it's, when is that due? That could have... The further version of that. Yeah. yeah. It, so we've it, already report, r- published you yeah. know, a considerable amount of it. It's been We're fairly condemning to, of the Met's actions so far. Absolutely. It has a number of recommendations for national policing and a number of recommendations for the Met and a number of areas that he highlighted as of, as of concern. Uh, absolutely. And, the, and you know, you'll see that again, I know, in a few weeks' time. Yes. Sa- same things, but more, more detail. OK. All right. And lastly, you may be aware of a Sky News investigation that's run today, which is in the world of Internet dating. They've discovered that in some instances, some people, some young people are being lured into this. And the revelation that children, one of them, six year old, have been sexually groomed or assaulted after contact with what are meant to be adult over 18 dating sites. This investigation, as I say, by that uh, by Sky News. What work can be done in that area? Mm. Well, I know that the, uh, yeah, I know there are obviously things that parents can do to put parental controls on their on their devices uh, and you know the idea of a six-year-old having access really to any device unsupervised it strikes me as not a parent but as an extraordinary thing i know the companies also are doing a huge amount uh, together and with us and with and with law enforcement to try to ensure that very young people could not have access to a site like that and okay. that age control is kind of Uh, written throughout the net it's technically very complicated um, but i think it's obviously where we should go this is an appalling thing to think about i've been told you need to go it's always best not to stop a police officer in the (laughs) students of their duty particularly if they're a dame cressida dick thank thank you you very much indeed news is next with with simon conway the met police commissioner has told lbc she expects to announce a further increase in the number of officers in her force carrying a taser dame cressida dick says the number has